it's Sunday afternoon. We're still in the quarantine lockdown time and we've had a weekend in the garden with a run and a bike ride. It's been great. But today on Low Carbon Lifestyle, I'm gonna talk about one of life's big taboos, which is money and finance. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about how we ended up being able to afford to do this extension and buy this house. My name is Tom and this is a little series about a low carbon lifestyle. Sometimes this whole sustainable living can feel well, well intimidating, whether it's thinking you need to buy an electric car or install solar panels on your roof. The majority of us can't do that overnight. We can't do that straight away. Or it looks like completely changing the way you live, living off the land or turning vegan overnight, both of which are fantastic things. But for this mini series, we're gonna talk through how each of us can lower our emissions in everyday life and what that might look like. Welcome to episode five of Low Carbon Lifestyle. I hope you're coping okay with the lockdown of the last few weeks and that these videos are giving you just a small amount of entertainment. Um, but here we go, episode five, finance. I am aware of the privilege that I have to even think about finance. Many of us won't experience having access to finance um, or having money to put into savings or being out of debt. Um, I personally have been blessed to have a steady wage for the last seven and a half years and I know that's not the case for everyone. But for some of you watching, some of you out there, you may have some access to some disposable income. You may have a mortgage, um, you may be looking to deal up a property, or you may kind of wonder where money comes from when you get a loan, or where, where it goes when you put it into savings, or where it goes when you put it into your pension and you may feel a little bit out of control with all those things. Well, in this episode, um, I want to get you to think a little bit about money. Hopefully, signposting you to ethical or sustainable ways that you can utilize your money and, and utilize it with the climate crisis in mind. I'm gonna talk a little bit about my experience of loans and savings. Uh, I'm gonna give some thinking around pensions and then I'll end with some ideas around sustainable investment. And I'll be asking the question, what does low carbon banking look like in a low carbon lifestyle. Obviously this episode comes with all those caveats you normally get on someone talking about finance and stuff. Um, and it says, this is not advice or telling you what to do or telling you where to put your investments, but this is just a little bit of help, you know. I'm not financial service authority backed, all that kind of thing. Just a little bit of help, a little bit of thinking. Cheers. Okay, so first of all, straight to it. Who do you bank with? Have you ever considered that this could be a way to impact sustainable development? Now, I don't claim to have much understanding of how the banking system works and all that magic, um, and I'm sure it's much more complicated than I currently understand. But I do know that there are some banks and building societies that are built with ethical or sustainable principles in mind. Have you looked into your bank and what their priorities are? We all have a choice about where we bank, whether that's for current accounts or for loans or for savings or mortgage or whatever. For example, when we were lucky to buy our first home, this home I'm in now, we were fortunate enough to stumble across Ecology Building Society. And they, they exist to provide loans uh, to improve the building stock around the UK with energy efficiency in mind. We were able to get a mortgage to renovate our home when other banks said that it was uninhabitable and we said challenge accepted and, and this meant that Ecology provided loan to buy the home in the first place and then at different stages of the project they released funds so we could pay for the work and they exist to finance energy efficiency improvements uh, and that means that our home now is much cheaper to run than it could have been um, and with all those uh, energy efficiency improvements our energy performance rating went from a G to a C which is much lower carbon. Ecology also provides savings accounts. Their website says that they're dedicated to improving the environment by supporting and promoting ecological building practices and sustainable communities. And they say they do this by using deposits in savings to do it, you know? So the next question is, could you move some savings to someone like Ecology? then maybe you could be helping finance energy improvements all around the UK and homes all around the UK. 
There are also some more traditional banks that are known for their ethical or sustainable practices. There's a bank called Triados or Triados, and they say they're committed to investing in positive change for people and planet. That sounds good. They say they're financing renewable generation, organic farming, and community groups. Now, I am sure they make profit that benefits their owners and their shareholders, but their vision is to provide a sustainable to provide sustainable finance and help promote low carbon lifestyles. So finally, on banks, there are banks like the Co-op, who I bank with, who for generations have been known for providing ethical banking for people with purpose. A bit of branding for you there. So are there ways that you can change where you bank? Can you put your money into a Triados or Ecology Savings account? Could you move your current account to, some, to someone else? Why do you bank where you do? Okay, banking done. The next area I want to think about is pension. And that's not something a 31 year old like me really spends much time daydreaming about. But I do know for the last seven and a bit years, about 5% of my salary each month has been going somewhere to someone to invest in some fund. Now at my old job, the pension was invested into one of the biggest fund operators in the world. It did change whilst I was there. Um, but we had something like 90 different funds that you could choose from if you wanted to have that little bit more control. If not, it was just invested for you. Two of those br were branded, two of those funds were branded as ethical. And that was basically defined as we don't invest in tobacco companies and some other dodgy companies with dodgy reputations. It didn't stop investment in coal, oil or gas or actually weapons manufacture, but that's a different story. But still, it was branded ethical. I would sometimes worry, what on earth did the other 80 odd uh, funds invest in that were less ethical? And what really scared me was that these funds, that, that my 5% a year that I was investing in, in the hope that someday I'd have a reasonable income when I retire, were actually contributing to investment in oil and gas development and exploration. And without here going into too much thinking around divestment, etc., um, those funds were not necessarily championing a low carbon transition by encouraging company boards to keep in the ground or to diverse away from the worst polluting fuels. That's not great. My current employer has a public sector pension scheme um, and one of my colleagues has been asking a question about whether we can remove investment in fossil fuels or campaign for divestment or campaign to keep it in the ground. And actually following the news recently about negative oil prices, I mean, what was all that about? You can imagine that investment in fossil fuels is not actually gonna be the most economically lucrative for our pensions. So on pensions, if you have, have one or are planning to start one, my question is simply, how is the money you're saving for your future being invested now? Will there be more or less chance of a safe future because of your investments? Can you find out how your fund managers are responding to the climate crisis? Can you ask them to do something about it? Okay, the final section of episode five is renewable investment. You know, I'm, I'm not someone that's rolling around in thousands and pounds of spare cash, and I know many of my peers aren't either, but are there ways that we can take our disposable income, that little bit left over at the end of some months, and invest it in promoting sustainable energy? Over the last few years, I've had a bit of a play with putting some money towards supporting sustainable investment through several different schemes. So first of all, um, I actually own a very small share in a solar farm near Bristol. Second of all, I've put small amounts of money into projects through the Abundance Investment Platform, which I'll link below, um, and that helps seed a variety of renewable energy projects all across the country. £20 here and there, you know. Um, and that includes investment in a tidal generator of Orkney, some pumped storage in Scotland, um, a couple of wind turbines, uh, a biomass generator in the Mono Valley, and, and all of that's invested at risk. And, and, and actually one of the projects that I invested in wasn't a success because of complications with um, the government's renewable heat incentive. But the investments, if successful, they, they actually want to pay back uh, your capital and pay back with a return that's much higher than many savings accounts. Some of them promising four, five, six, seven percent return on your investment. <laughs> That's kind of good if it works out. So over the last few years, I've put small chunks of money into a variety of projects. Would you ever consider doing that? Would you look into it? 
And further afield, there are groups that allow you to invest in renewable structure. That word was infrastructure, infrastructure. All around the world. And um, there's one called Energize Africa that does exactly that. And it allows investment into re renewable energy projects across Africa. I've even signed up to a monthly subscription that tells me it will offset, whatever that means, we'll get into that another day, my emissions. Um, it says it'll offset my emissions each month by planting and restoring forests all around the world. I don't get anything back from that, but I feel at least a little bit of it is a worthy cause. And then I guess finally, are there any investments that you can make into your own home? Like we did here, can you improve the energy efficiency of home by upgrading insulation, replacing the windows, upgrading your boiler, or maybe even replacing your boiler with a heat pump? Could you even look at installing some solar panels? And yeah, this, it, despite all the news stories about the end of the lucrative government subsidy for solar, a roof full of panels is still likely to pay back in savings of your energy bills uh, in maybe 12 to 15 years. And it's not a bad investment if you had a spare five thousand pounds lying around. I don't at the moment, shame, um, until this YouTube vlogger life kicks in, obviously. Um, but actually, as we talked about in episode four, um, when we all start getting electric vehicles, which one day I hope we will, having solar panels on your roof means you get free fuel for your car as well. If you've got your, if you've got your, your car plugged in when the sun is shining and the solar panels are generating on the roof, then you get free miles. This all starts to work together and that low carbon lifestyle one day could be really cool. And if you did want to do some serious improvement in your home, like solar panels, then may maybe a loan from someone like Ecology that helps to do homes up or actually many banks that will help improve the quality of your asset. You could do have some investment to help reduce your emissions today. Would you be willing to take a loan for that? Okay, I guess that's basically everything I want to talk about it to do with sustainable finance. Where do you bank? How is your pension being invested? And are there any investments that you could make with your spare cash that would help promote a sustainable lifestyle? And actually, as we come out of this crisis where loads of people are struggling for work or are furloughed, a business's income has disappeared overnight, we really need to think as a society and as a community, what are our priorities as we rebuild? Can we as individuals, can we as community groups, can we as regions and can we as a nation invest all this kind of seed money, you know, all this money that the government's promising to make sure that we'll be okay. Can we prioritize where that goes to help the climate crisis as well? Can we prioritize sustainable development? Can we prioritize renewable generation? Those kind of questions I hope we can be answering and asking, asking and answering um, over the next six to nine months as we recover from this and over the next few years. But wouldn't it be real, 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 real good, you know, to, to help solve and come out of this crisis by solving and coming out of another one. Okay, that's all I've got, I've got for episode five. Hopefully later on in the week or over the weekend, I'll be coming up with episode six, which I hope will be a book review of some fantastic books I've read on uh, the climate, sustainable development and sustainable economics. And one more thing as I'm about to upload this video. Um, today, the UK just broke another really relevant climate record. Um, we've just gone the longest period of time without gener generating electricity from coal power plants, and that's since the 1880s. And this is a massive change from where we, are, we were seven or eight years ago, where we got about 50% of our electricity from coal power plants to last year, where it was just over 2%. And we really should be celebrating that, that shift, that shift away from dirty coal to cleaner gas and renewables. But this is the area where we've made extraordinary progress whilst transport um, emissions have gone up and emissions linked to buildings have more or less flatlined. So when we get news like this, yes, we should celebrate, but we should also double our efforts um, to stop burning the next fossil fuel we can think of, whether that is petrol or diesel in our cars, motorbikes, lorries, road sweepers, tractors, etc., or gas in our homes to heat hot water um, or to heat food. We still need substantial effort across the board to decarbonize the rest of this nation. So yeah, I thought I'd add that because it's news today and it's really exciting um, that we've now got a record of almost 19 days without burning coal to get electricity, but we still need to make substantial change. Cheers.
like and subscribe. Seen again.